This video shows how the normal vector to a surface in a curved space can be calculated. It begins with calculating the usual normal vector in Euclidean space using vector calculus before going on to explain the equivalent calculation in curved spaces using the covariant derivative. Now, a subscriber has asked me to make this video um, because in the previous video this expression was given and he was wondering how it could be used to calculate the normal. And what I want to point out in this video is it's not all really all that different from the familiar vector calculus in Euclidean space, how we calculate the normal there. So anyway, let's start with some given surface f as a function of the coordinates in that space, however many dimensions you have, and we'll set that equal to a constant. So some function is constant, and we'll see how that is, how it's equal to a constant. How do we calculate the normal vector of the surface in curved space? Well, this is the expression for it, but what does this mean? Well, to show what it means, let's begin in flat Euclidean space, where the normal vector to the above surface is given by n is del or nabla of the scalar f, and that's defined according to these partial derivatives multiplied by these basis vectors, up to however many dimensions we have. So, for example, uh, given the surface specified by f of x, y, z is x squared plus y squared plus z equals zero, we'll begin by just having a bit of a look at what that looks like. Here it is, a 3D plot, and uh, z equals minus x squared plus y squared, or this object here equal to zero. Um, here's our surface here. All right. Each of these are normal vectors, and they point in different directions and on, at different places on the surface. These normal vectors are perpendicular to the basis vectors at each point. So if you picked a, this point here, and the basis vector in this direction, pointing in, uh, in the y direction, this one pointing in the x direction, and this normal will be perpendicular to both of those. Each of these basis vectors, by the way, are tangent to these coordinate lines here. At that point P, they are tangent to the coordinate lines. Anyway, the normal vectors are perpendicular to those basis vectors there. And they are um, uh, pointing in different directions at different points in the space. All right, so a normal vector of the surface is found using vector calculus, the familiar vector calculus from Euclidean space. N is del f, is this object here, as we saw earlier, and that gives us 2x times the basis vector in the x direction, plus 2y times the basis vector in the y direction, plus the basis vector in the z direction. Now, in flat space, the line element or measure of distance in this space is given by ds squared is dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. Familiar Pythagoras in three dimensions, if you like. What we can also do is we can write it in terms of this object here we'll call a metric times each of these differentials, dxi, dxj. And we'll sum i and j um, over the x, y, and z. And as we'll see shortly, next page, where the metric gij is this object here. Now this is the identity matrix, so it's, it is its own inverse. So the inverse metric, this one here with both indices raised, is still the identity matrix here. They are each other's inverse. So, for, but in general, for a diagonal metric, each element of the inverse is just given by the reciprocal of the element along the diagonal. Okay, so. That's for more general cases where it's not the identity matrix that is involved, and we'll see that later on. Now this line element can be written then, ds squared, our familiar Pythagoras, but just with these little terms in here, inserted gxx, which is 1, gyy, which is that one there, gzz, which is that one there. But it could also be written as g upper xx, which is that object, g upper yy, which is that object, and g upper zz, which is that object there. Now, with this metric, our normal vector can be written as n equals del f, is n times these inverse metric terms, elements, times these partial derivatives, derivatives times the basis vector. Here we go. We can express that more succinctly, more compactly, in terms of the, met the inverse metric times partial derivatives with respect to the coordinate xi times the j. J sums over x, y, and z, and the same with i, and it goes over x, y, and z. Now this partial derivative can be written more succinctly by this object here, with a little subscript i, meaning the partial der derivative of f with respect to the coordinate x, i. There it is. This almost looks like the expression we started with, because compare this with this one, 
it's almost there. You can see we have the partial derivative. Here we have the covariant derivative. This is for curved spaces. Let's keep going. All right, in curved space, let's consider as an example the surface of a sphere of radius a. And so the equation for that is this, this one here, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is a squared. Let's write that as some scalar function, x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus a squared, which is equal to zero. Now, using coordinates x1, x2, x3 is the Cartesian coordinates x, y, and z. We'll transform from Cartesian coordinates x, y, and z to r theta phi, spherical polar coordinates, using these transformation equations here. There we go. And then in these coordinates, the surface can be given by this scalar function, f of r theta phi is r squared minus a squared. And to work in this space, we need to find its basis vectors. So here's the position vector in Cartesian space. In flat Euclidean space, transformed to spherical polar coordinates, it becomes this object here. And uh, the partial derivative of this position vector with respect to x1 is dr dr. It gives us the basis vector in the radial direction, the r direction. dr dx2 or dr d theta gives us the basis vector in the theta direction. Basis vector in the phi direction is the r d phi. So that's the partial der derivative here of r with respect to each of the coordinates. So in the radial direction, the basis vector in the radial direction, e subscript r, is dr dr. So take the partial der derivative of this object with respect to r, that gives us this object. For the theta direction, the basis vector there is the partial derivative of the position vector with respect to theta, and that gives us this object. And then in the phi direction, the basis vector is found by the partial derivative of this object with respect to phi, and that gives us this object here. All right, now the metric in this space, g subscript ij, or covariant indices i and j, both down, is the, is the scalar or dot product of each of the basis vectors. We go through that systematically, so er dotted with er, er dotted with e theta, theta, er dotted with e phi, gives us this 3 by 3 matrix here. We find that the off-diagonal terms are all zero, and along the diagonal we end up performing these calculations, we end up with 1 here, r squared, r squared, sine squared, theta. Now each element in this metric can be written with these little lowered indices, g theta r for instance, g theta theta is this term here, element here. Oh. Now the covariant derivative of a scalar is just its partial derivative. So for a scalar, the covariant derivative just becomes its partial derivative. So the normal is, here's our expression we started out with, which didn't look familiar. There's actually now, when we expand it out, GRR, put in the R's, put in the thetas, put in the phi's. Okay, now replace these covariant derivatives, because it's a scalar F involved, with the partial derivative, gives us this object here object. Now, if you remember, this scalar function f is a function of r and the constant a, and so partial derivative of that scalar f with respect to theta or with phi will disappear, so these terms drop out, and we're only left with this term here. Alright, the inverse metric here is just again the reciprocal of the elements along the diagonal. There we go. And so del r, the covariant derivative of f with respect to the r coordinate, times dr is just df dr, that. And so that's d dr partial derivative with respect to r of this scalar function, r squared minus a squared. Scalar here, I shouldn't say function, but scalar. Um, at times er, so that gives us 2r times er. And this gives us M is GRR, upper indices, del R, F, E, R. GRR was 1, so it's 1 times this we found earlier. 1 times 2R, E, R is just 2 times R times E, R. So it's for a sphere that's happening in the right direction, it's in the radial direction and it's outward, so that's, that's good. Now we can use the following equation to find a unit normal to a surface, which may look a little bit unfamiliar, but you think about it, these covariant derivatives down here, del m of f and del n of f, will, will be replaced by partial derivatives. And this covariant derivative up here will be replaced by partial derivative. 
Now first we need to find the unit basis vectors, ER hat, E theta hat, E phi hat. So let's have a look at those. All right, ER, well, that's the basis vector in the radial direction. Let's take its magnitude. Modulus ER, absolute value ER, that gives us 1. So that implies that ER is its own unit vector. Let's do the same for the basis vector in the theta direction. We take the modulus or absolute value of that. We find its magnitude is R. And so E theta hat is 1 on R E theta, as we normally do with vectors to produce a unit vector. So in the theta direction, the unit vector is given by this. In the phi direction, when we take here's E, here's the basis vector in the phi direction. Let's take its magnitude. We get R sine theta. And so a base, a unit vector in the phi direction, unit basis vector E hat, in the phi direction would be 1 on R sine theta times E phi. And keep going. Okay, so what does that look like? Here's our basis vectors, all three of them, or our unit basis vectors, all three of them. Okay, here's our sphere. The basis vector in the theta direction, the unit vector points that way. Basis vector in the phi direction points that way. Just picking this point here, same at any other point. They all point in different directions because they're different points on the sphere. And the radial vector, the radial unit vector, ER, points this direction outwards, the positive. You'll see there's actually two shortly. Okay, let's go now and let's see if we can find a unit normal vector for this surface, uh, for this space or manifold if you like. We have this object here, let's expand it out. So the M and the N and the I's and the J's are going to be replaced with the R, R. Remember, the metric we had, GMN or GIJ, only had diagonal terms. R, R, theta, theta, phi, phi. So when we expand that out, get this. Some over here, the theta, thetas. Some over here, the phi's, phi's. All right. Next thing we do, okay, is we notice that these will become part, these covariant deriv derivatives of F with respect to phi and with respect to theta will just become partial derivatives. And if you remember that the scalar function was a function of r and the constant a only, and so these partial root derivatives will cause these terms here to go to zero, and we're left with just this first term, which will give us, from our earlier calculations, 1 over this object here times 2r e r hat. Work all that through, and we'll end up with two possible unit normal vectors, one in the outward direction, plus, and one in the inward direction, minus this. To this surface, there's two. One out and one in. One pointing out, one pointing in. Okay, and an image here, just back to our sphere again. Here's our unit radial basis vector. There, in the R direction, pointing out. The negative one will point in. And the next one over, just also note before we finish, uh, we can write the normal vector in terms of its components, which is the inverse metric here times this covariant derivative of f, they're the, they're the components, and times the basis vector, so components n contravariant j times the basis vector here, so this upper index here, and for the unit normal, same thing again here, here are our components, here's the basis vector, these are our components here, this fractional part here, and then here's our basis vectors here. And that's it.